privilege of being here. Okay, thank you. Um, wow, what a song. Um, I grew up in Waxahachie, Texas. Waxahachie is an Indian word, it means next to Walmart. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to say something about that in just a minute. But boy, that, you know, that, that, that should take us right to where we belong. And I'm, I'm talking about in our churches and in our personal lives. Let's not lose that. Amen. I'm talking about old-fashioned Bible preaching and Bible believing Christianity that most of us grew up with. Amen. Um, I'm, I wonder if through all this that's been going on the last year and a half, if God did not give us a little glimpse of uh, how easy it would be to lose yeah. what was provided for us by the blood, sweat, and tears of people who have gone before us, Amen. Uh, of which the world is not worthy. Um, Emily and I were talking the other day about on Memorial Day, what a blessing it is to have a country that still has, I believe, the hope of being what we should be. Uh, and uh, thank you, men who served in the military, for your service and sacrifice. Exodus chapter 1, please. And while you're turning there, let me tell you, we have, over in the Spanish department, we have a table with some books, four of them. The only, the one, only ones in English are the ones that my wife Emily uh, wrote. This is my wife Emily. And uh, I was going to mention a couple of them. She wrote one called What I Learned From My Parents. Uh, Emily grew up in a, in, in a wonderful Christian home and uh, was very attentive and, and uh, paid attention to her parents. Uh, her pastor several years ago challenged the church that she was attending uh, during uh, Thanksgiving month in November to take a few minutes every day and just write down something that they were thankful for. Well, Emily started that and she did it the whole year and she wrote this devotional book called 365 Days of Thankfulness. Uh, you would enjoy that. And then uh, this is this is the one that I, I think is so uh, meaningful. Uh, as I mentioned in the video, uh, God used Emily to disciple my uh, daughter-in-law, Jenny, who is the wife of our son, Jonathan, who's now pastor of the church that I started, a wonderful Christian lady. And uh, Emily wrote down some, some things, some thoughts about what she did to help Jenny become the Christian lady that she is. Uh, she had no help at home. No one in her family attended church. The only time her mother attended church with her was on her wedding day. And uh, this would be a help for anyone that uh, wants to work with young people and uh, help them to become what God wants them to, to be. And then my wife, my sister, Billy Sloan, uh, wrote a book, a, a chronicle of her experiences with, uh, that she and her, her husband, my brother-in-law, Tom Sloan, had on the mission field for almost 50 years. If you'd like to uh, go to the uh, Spanish department, and those books are there. Thank you for considering that. Exodus chapter 1, we're going to read one verse because you know the background of this verse. And we'll just read one verse and then I want to talk to you for a few minutes about this verse. I was preaching in a church not too long ago and uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. Monday night after the service, a fellow came up to me and he said, uh, you preach too long. Just walked off. Tuesday night, same guy came up to me and said, This is a boring sermon. Walked off. Wednesday night, same guy came up and he said, You didn't study, did you? <laughs> he just left. You know, sometimes it's better just to leave things as they are. I had the right to remain silent, but not the ability. <laughs> so I asked the pastor, I said, 
Pastor, who is this fellow? Oh, Brother Ashley, I said, no, no, don't pay attention. He has problems. He said he just goes around repeating what he hears everyone else say. <laughs> I wish I had not asked that question. I hope when the service is over this morning that you don't have any of those impressions. <laughs> Exodus chapter 1, Brother Jorge over here reminded me of uh, how we've known each other for longer than either one of us would like to remember and uh, reminded me of a couple of things. I'm not going to mention them because, anyway, Brother Jorge, good to see you. God bless you. Verse 12, Exodus chapter 1, verse 12, says, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. You know the story here. Israel had been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years. Um, they, during that time, uh, there arose a king that knew not Joseph. And uh, they were afflicted. They increased their affliction. Uh, to translate into our terms today, they increase their taxes to an unbearable level. Hmm, sounds familiar, doesn't it? But here's what happened when they were under that affliction and that oppression. The more they afflicted them, the more they grew and multiplied. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church. I thank you for the substantial financial support that uh, they have invested in our ministry, not just monthly, but uh, in investing in different projects down through the years, most recently uh, concerning our property issues. Thank you for using them uh, to make it possible for us to be what we are, uh, where we are. Pray that you continue to bless them. This church has been a blessing to us, and I pray this morning that you'd use your servant to be a blessing and a help to them. Use the next few minutes, I pray, to glorify your name and to help us to become what we should be and make wise decisions about what we are to do at this point in our respective lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You are as aware as I am of the dangerous times in which we live. I believe that the Apostle Paul may have been referring to these days as perilous times. It's difficult to find a similar event in human history that has so drastically touched every single human being on the planet. The only event that I can think of that has had this much negative effect on so many people is the universal flood. And I think Jesus said something about as in the days of Noah, amen. But at the same time, these could be the most interesting and exciting times in recent memory. They certainly are for the student of Bible prophecy. We as Christians should never, ever lose sight of the fact that we were not left here just to survive, much less to be comfortable. I hate the term that has been used, and especially in the beginning of all this debacle that we're going through now, hunker down. This is not a time to hunker down. We were placed here to make a difference, Amen. an eternal difference. God has put us here to serve, not to be served. We are here to give, not to take. We are here to produce, not to consume. Our message of hope, the message of the gospel is exactly what is needed by people who have no idea what is taking place all around them. All they see is that the way of life to which they have become so accustomed is being threatened. Guidelines and 
mandates and restrictions and regulations, limited movement, financial loss, all of those things pale in comparison with the reality of what God is really doing. And just as things never went back to normal after 9-11, I doubt that we will ever again see things as they were before 15 or 16 months ago. God is repairing us, the redeemed, for the blessed hope in the next event in his prophetic calendar. And he is setting, setting the stage for the unregenerate world to be judged. What we must do is to make sure that we are where we are supposed to be and that we are doing what we are supposed to be doing. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. I wonder if in a few years that will be said of the people that are sitting in this room today. Several years ago, I was in a missions conference in Louisiana, and I heard an evangelist, a man that I have the utmost respect for, say something that just did not make sense. He said that Christians giving increased during the Great Depression. Not only that, he said that giving during the Great Depression was greater than giving in the year 2000. And I found that hard to believe, so I never repeated it until finding reliable documentation to confirm the accuracy of what he said. Well, I found that documentation. You want to hear it? Among church members of 11 primary Protestant denominations or their historical antecedents in the United States and Canada, per member giving as a percentage of income was lower in the year 2000 than in either 1921 or 1933. In 1921, per member giving as a percentage of income was 2.9%. In 1933, in the depth of the Great Depression, per member giving grew to 3.3%. That's a 14% increase during the Great Depression. By 2000, after half a century of unprecedented prosperity, giving had fallen to 2.6%. That's a 21% decrease. 21st century Christians are giving 14% less than Great Depression Christians. No wonder they call them the greatest generation. This is amazing on several levels, but it should not surprise us. Down through history, God's people in general, and churches in particular, I'm talking about Bible-believing churches, have survived and even thrived during times of adversity. It seems that Christians in general, and churches in particular, respond better to adversity than to prosperity. Amen. Adversity tends to bring out the best in us, and prosperity tends to lull us to sleep, both spiritually and in almost every other way. My father, L.H. Ashcraft, was born in 1916 during the Spanish flu epidemic. I never heard him or my mother or either of my grandparents mention the Spanish flu. They did speak of the Great Depression. My dad, his two brothers, and my grandparents moved from western Arkansas to Fort Worth, Texas in 1928 in a covered wagon. My dad was 17 years old in 1933. He and his two brothers and his father worked 12 hours a day planting onions for 20 cents an hour in order to survive. Dad said that they were so poor that if someone broke into their house to steal, they would help him look for something worth stealing. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see if this axiom holds up among 21st century Christians during this present adversity, namely the coronavirus. When did it stop being the coronavirus and become COVID-19? I'll tell you when. When uh, the sale of Corona beer decreased by 35%, that's when <laughs> it became the COVID. The man of God 
warned Israel about this in Amos 6.1. He said, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. And if you read the rest of that chapter, it's obvious that God's people had become lax and lazy, enjoying a season of opulence and prosperity, and at the same time neglecting their spiritual lives. I'm going to say something. Please do not interpret this as political. It is not. It's just a statement of, of it's just an observation. President Trump's campaign slogan was Make America Great Again. MAGA caps and T-shirts and all kinds of paraphernalia have been abundant. The degree of success that President Trump's policies may have had in making America great again is a matter of opinion. You're entitled to yours as well as I am to mine, and they're both worth about the same thing. There may be some areas in where we became great again, but we did not become godly again. And while we reveled in one of the greatest economic booms in history, I'm afraid that we have neglected the most important aspect of our national condition, our recognition of God in every area of our lives. Many Bible scholars believe that the United States of America does not appear in Bible prophecy. We are almost an historical and prophetic and eschatological afterthought. That said, I believe that aside from Israel, America may have been the most blessed nation in history, very probably for two reasons. Number one, um, our support and defense of Israel. And number two, our use, our being used to promote the cause of worldwide evangelism. No other nation has done more to support and defend God's chosen people than the United States of America. No other nation in history has sent more missionaries abroad than, than this country has. No nation has experienced more revival, produced more Bibles, more preachers, more churches, and preached more gospel than this country. You may be aware that almost all of the Ivy League, as well as many other prominent universities, were established for the purpose of training Bible-preaching preachers. Yale, Harvard, Princeton, Brown, University of Chicago, Wake Forest, Baylor, SMU, TCU were all founded on Bible principles. Some of their founders would make some of us independent fundamental Baptists look like rank liberals. It is my belief that America has had, if not the only, at least one of the very few militaries in history whose basic design has not been conquest and occupation, but liberation. Someone said that America's greatness lies in America's kindness. With all her flaws and mistakes, and by the way, if America is, if, if we suffer from systemic racism, why do all the other countries want to come here? I believe it's been the most positive worldwide influence in the history of mankind. We share our prosperity, our knowledge, our technology, our progress, our inventions, our people, and our nation itself with the rest of the world. In times of disaster abroad, America is always the first to respond with humanitarian, medical, and economic aid. Only Israel is a first, or is a close second. Emma Lazarus, composed the poem inscribed on the base of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. It's called the New Colossus. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gate shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, mother of exiles, from her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to be free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. There was a time 
when school children were required to memorize this poem. I attended elementary school, as I mentioned, Waxahachie, Texas. By the way, don't ask a man where he's from. If he's from Texas, he'll tell you. If he's not, don't embarrass him. <laughs> Every morning, the principal over the speakers into each classroom read a verse of scripture and prayed. My seventh grade teacher called me Little Preacher. My dad was a pastor in that town. He was a good friend of my dad's. He called me Little Preacher, and it was considered a compliment. Today, it would be considered a pejorative. But I'm afraid that we have become at ease in Zion. I fear that we have come to assume that we will always go from good to better, from much to more, from prosperity to prosperity, from comfort to more comfort, from ease to more ease. Well, my friend, that may have just come to a screeching halt. If this pandemic lasts as long as currently projected and as long as some seem to want it to last, and if it has the effect that is now being predicted, nothing will ever again be the same. I do not pretend to know if this has been sent by God to awaken us, but I do know that it will either open our eyes or further blind us depending on our response. We will either have a Second Chronicles 714 repentance or we will succumb to the Pharaoh-like hardening of the heart, to God's patience and long-suffering. There will be no neutral ground. Have we come to our time of reckoning with God? Is this a point in history in which we as God's people humble ourselves and in repentance pray and seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways? Or will we attempt to go on as though nothing happened, hoping that the government will get us back to some degree of normalcy? Are we about to see the end of the times of the Gentiles and the ushering end of the men of sin? Satan does not know when the coming of the Son of Man will be. Jesus said that that is in the Father's own power. Stands to reason, then, I've believed this for a long time, that in every generation, Satan must prepare someone capable of assuming the role of Antichrist. I believe that since the ascension of Christ into heaven, Satan has had someone at all times prepared to assume the position of the Antichrist. He has to. Uh, the world's response to this pandemic shows how easily the world will succumb to fear to the point in which they are willing to accept anyone who has a solution to such a complex problem. Amen. By the way, this is my belief, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to get you to do or not do anything. I have, I have the impression that this does about as much good as this. And according to Fauci, that's true. Anyway, <laughs> limiting the movement of the sick is quarantine. Limiting the movement of the healthy is tyranny. First John 2.18, little children, it is the last time. And as you heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that this is the last time. That was written in the first century under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. These were and have been and will continue to be, or there, there, there are and there, there will and continue to be many Antichrists. Most Baptists believe in the imminence of the return of Christ, that he could come at any moment and could have appeared at any moment 
since the ascension of Christ into heaven. Paul's writings leads us to believe that he believed that. The term soon coming has to do with the quickness of his coming. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 7, that his coming would be preceded by nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. Nation against nation? Anybody need documentation for that? Famines? Do you realize that around 9 million people die every year of hunger? Is that not a pandemic? A child dies every 10 seconds of malnutrition. Earthquakes. As of today, June 6th, in the last 24 hours, there have been 106 earthquakes in the United States. 756 in the last seven days. 2,817 in the last 10 days. 38,034 in the last 365 days in the United States. Pestilences. The pandemic that we are seeing today, without a doubt, is nothing short of a pestilence. And while not unprecedented in history, one of the worst being the uh, aforementioned Spanish flu. By the way, the Spanish flu did not start in Spain. It started in Kansas. Study your history. <laughs> what is unprecedented is the international universal response that we see and the almost complete alteration of societal normalcy. Almost nothing in our routines has been uninterrupted. Uh, business, employment, schools, theaters, amusement parks, churches, birthday parties, everything. Can you name one social event that has not been interrupted? But I can't. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Thank you for listening to my introduction. Let me preach to you for just a second. Number one, if these are not the last days before the coming of the Lord, we should treat them as though they were. We should have been doing that all along. Maybe this will help us to treat these days as the last days before the coming of the Lord. These happenings should not only intensify our awareness of the quickness or suddenness with which Jesus could come, it should intensify our activity concerning what we're supposed to be doing. This awareness should be accompanied by an increased intensity in our efforts to get the gospel out. And it, 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 it's, everybody knows we've had to alter some things. Your pastor mentioned that. We've had to make some changes and some adjustments. But they should, they should not limit our intensity in getting the gospel out. There's always a way to get the gospel out. We must follow the directive of Hebrews 10.25 and exhort and encourage one another. If you're at home watching this on live stream, God bless you. And if you have to be there, we understand. But don't stay one more day longer than you have to. Get back to church. It says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. It doesn't say not forsaking the live streaming of ourselves. While these are terribly troubling times, our outlook, our personal response, our message to the world should be one of hope and of love and security and promise. We should not, as Christians, we should not be so profoundly shaken by the fear with which the world has been gripped that we are paralyzed in what we're supposed to be doing. No one apart from a Bible-believing Christian can offer such a message or such a perspective to a world in chaos. The world is in a mess, but my world does not have to be in a mess. I heard a Chinese pastor who said something interesting and convicting. He said, please request that Western Christians not pray that Chinese Christians be relieved of persecution. He said that it was persecution that had intensified their devotion to Christ. 
He also said that he believed that the next wave of missionaries would come from China because Chinese Christians are willing to go anywhere and they are not afraid to die. What an amazing commentary on these dear brethren's Christianity. I wonder how our Christianity compares to theirs. I doubt that they would understand our level of commitment or our lack of commitment. The more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied and grew. What would be the response of modern day Western Christians to the degree of persecution to which our Chinese brethren have become suggested, uh, subjected? What's going to take to get us to refrain from being at ease in Zion? Are we going to allow our hunkering down, which we're told, we're told is necessary in order to avoid infection? Are we going to allow that to bleed over into our spiritual lives and our service and dedication to God and our obedience to the Great Commission? Would God that what was said of the Israelites under Pharaoh be said of us? The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And perhaps this is just what is, it's going to take to bring about that revival that so many of us have prayed for. History has shown that revival seldom comes from prosperity and ease. It's usually the product of adversity and persecution and severe suffering. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The pastor asked one of his missionaries how he could challenge his American church to be more seriously active in the Great Commission. David Hasselflock, missionary to the Balkans, responded to the pastor with this reply. Let them know the incredible difficulty of leaving houses and lands for the gospel. It's easy to feel the tingly sensations of a missionary surrender by listening to a well-crafted, musically powerful missionary DVD in a climate-controlled auditorium and then hearing an impassioned sermon but turn off the AC when you preach the sermon pump in the smells of body odor and strange food and cigarette smoke and other unidentifiable pungent fragrances blast some insipid Balkan or tribal music in the background talk about depression and loneliness and pain and smog and disease and threats and fears and danger and discomfort and frustration Talk about the illogical grammar. Talk about being, there being ten demises that rip your heart out for every Timothy that is faithful. Talk about pouring out blood, sweat, and tears and seeing the harvest come in more slowly than you had thought it would. Talk about missionary kids struggling to adjust, uh, to, to adjust and forever becoming third cultural people, neither being American or Timbuktuan, missionary sacrifice is overwhelming. This isn't the fine print. It's plastered all over the New Testament. But missionaries fail to present this side because we don't want to be, sound like we're bellyaching or complaining. At the same time, let them know the incredible reward of doing all this for Christ's sake. Amen. Talk up the joy that was set before Christ at the cross. Talk up the eternal treasure. Mention the party thrown over one Verses the 90 and 9 overshadow the immense difficulties of the missionary sacrifice by the overwhelming re rewards of eternity. Make them jealous for God's glory and tell them how incredibly amazing it is to see God turn on the spiritual light in a pagan's heart. Tell them of, or help them imagine how tear-jerkingly awesome it is to hear a sinner calling upon the name of the Lord after being convicted by the Holy Spirit through someone as unworthy as they. 
And even in the absence of such conversions on a huge scale, let them know that there is great fulfillment in knowing that amidst the pagan sounds and oppressive darkness, you have been sent as a light, lit by the light. And though no one come, though no one heed, you are there, and they know you are there, and he knows you are there, and he is there with you all way until it's all over and you go to your final sleep saying, I left it all out there on the field and it was worth it all. Now, how will you respond to this crisis in regards to your personal commitment to the cause of getting the gospel to those who have never heard? Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if our response to all these challenges would be to go beyond what is expected or imagined that we would do? Don't you think that God would be pleased if we surpassed all expectations in our efforts to reach this poor, sin-sick, confused, chaotic, messed-up world with the only message that can make a difference? The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Heavenly Father, thank you for a cause to which we can dedicate our lives and our resources and our time that can make an eternal difference. Thank you for your word that tells us of others that have gone before, that have paid the price. and We have no right to waste their sacrifice. I pray that you'd help us to make decisions in our personal lives that will help us to be used to make a difference for other lives. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Pastor.